this event. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Um, as some of you might know, it's a kind of merger of two events, so we're kind of mixing together two book tours here. Um, and the way we're going to format it is Richard Seymour is going to start off by giving us a, a short talk about his book, and then we're going to have the same thing from Peter. And then after that, we'll have an opportunity for some questions from the audience. Um, so we're just going to start off with Richard Seymour. He's an editor at Salvage magazine, and he's a writer and broadcaster, and most recently he's written this book here, um, which is Corbyn, The Strange Rebirth of Radical Politics. Um, you can buy that here tonight. It's usually £13, but it's £8 for tonight. Um, so yes. <coughs> Uh, okay, so I suppose the, the question I start with in the book, and it's still pretty relevant today, and it's one that we all have to um, deal with, is how can it be that the British Labour Party, the British Labour Party, has the most left-wing social democratic leader in Europe? How can it be that the British left, after years of defeat and decline, on every front, has suddenly produced the first leader, the first radical left, the first hard left leader of the Labour Party. Because of, even at the height of its strengths, the Labour Party has never had a powerful hard left. Right? There's always been a minority. It's always been out of power. Uh, the, even the sort of Benite surge has been, was wildly overstated at the time, simply due to the fact that he had the backing of some uh, influential uh, union leaders. But basically, uh, the Benite movement was wildly overstated, and it never had a chance of achieving power. So this is quite a unique moment. And yet it follows a period in which, if you look on it at every front, the core of the labor movement, trade union density, declining, secular decline for years, um, strike rates, lowest levels on record, especially after 2011. There was a brief uh, spike in 2011 when the public sector unions had a, a little bit of symbolic resistance to austerity, big sort of demonstrative strike actions resulting in very little practically at all. Um, in terms of the membership of left-wing political parties, it's been a decline for decades, not just the Labour Party, you know, in terms of the membership of its left wing, but uh, of all left wing political parties, there's been an implosion. And of course, the uh, implosion of the Trotsky group of schools um, and parties was um, a sort of the final phase of that. Uh, decline in left wing publications. Most of the left wing publications started to die out uh, from the 1980s onwards, in terms of readership, in terms of uh, the actual number of them, and so on. So we got to a stage in 2015. Uh, when things were looking pretty bleak, the Tories had just won an election after implementing austerity. It wasn't full-on austerity, but they got elected with the Liberals, detoxified themselves, and then won an election by themselves after implementing cuts. After <coughs> some of the, the longest period of declining living standards um, that British workers faced for a long time, we ended up with a Conservative government. And it looked as though, in 2015, the Blairites were going to be the major ones to benefit. And if you look at uh, the arguments that were coming out, overwhelmingly it was, Ed Miliband screwed it up because he was too left-wing. Red Ed uh, spoiled Labour's uh, election chances. And when Jeremy Corbyn was standing as a potential uh, leadership candidate, I mean, this is before he even got on the ballot. Nobody in his campaign team, least of all him, expected him to get on the ballot. Because the whole point about the Labour Party leadership elections is that there is a veto. The Parliamentary Labour Party has a veto on who gets on the ballot. You need to have, um, I think since the Collins reforms, you need to have 15% of Labour MPs uh, nominate you to even get on the ballot. So. There was a sense that they wouldn't even get that many MPs to say Jeremy Corbyn can be one of the candidates and participate in the debate. But already, even at this stage, there was the beginnings of a kind of ferment that hadn't been there in previous left-wing leadership campaigns, like, for example, uh, John McDonald's campaign, uh, short-lived as it was. Um, 
uh, the attempt uh, to you know, mount a campaign for the left on an anti-capitalist platform didn't get anywhere. This time, there was already a little bit of a ferment. And initially, it was just a ferment of saying, we don't want another Labour leadership election in which all the three candidates are pretty identical, all the arguments are coming from the right, uh, we've heard them all before, everybody's going to be turned off, everybody's going to be bored stiff, can we not at least have a little bit of variety in this debate? And Jeremy Corbyn probably seemed to them like a safe way to have variety, because there was no chance he was going to win. Luke Akehurst um, from Labour First said, I want Jeremy Corbyn to be on the ballot because I need to see, we, we need to see these ideas defeated in an open contest. I didn't quite work out like that, but essentially that was the idea. So, quite a lot of people who voted for Corbyn to get on the ballot, uh, there was a Newcastle MP who wrote a blog about it saying, basically I just had hundreds of emails saying, can we please have him on the ballot? I don't agree with his policies, but I'm going to nominate him so that at least we have the debate. And that's what happened, he gets on the ballot. The next thing he has to do is not just win over the membership and attract new members, but he also has to win over the trade unions. And then he has to win over some sort of wider media cultural battle. Well, how does he do that? Trade unions in this country have never, ever, ever backed the radical left candidate for the Labour leadership. They just don't do it. In their history, they always select either the centre candidate or the right wing candidate uh, in exchange for a little bit of quid pro quo. Right? Give us some humane policies that we can sell to our members as gains, and we will support you and not embarrass you in any way. Even in the new Labour period, when the unions were becoming more and more politicised in response to uh, new Labour's uh, terrible uh, policies and governing from the right, they still reached the Warwick Agreement, a classic corporatist agreement where you sit down with the Labour leadership and you say, give us a few decent policies, and in that case, we won't embarrass you on Iraq, and we won't embarrass you on the marketization and privatization of the public sector. And so they went into the 2005 election keeping their minds shut about those issues, even though they were very big issues at the time. Um, so basically the unions uh, have never been this uh, force for radical change, either on the Labour Party or more generally, and yet this is how they've been kept uh, in the 2015 election. And I think you have to look at it in terms of their um, existential crisis. Okay? And by that, I don't just mean that they have had declining union membership and declining union density and all the rest of it. Um, their situation as uh, a political factor, as the major factor in the uh, constitution of the Labour Party, as essentially the Labour Party being their party, as opposed to them just being a client, was under threat. Tony Blair had attempted to transform the Labour Party into the Democratic Party of the US, sort of modeled along those lines, had attempted to reduce the unions to the status of another client who could give a little bit of money, get a little bit of policy in return. Um, hadn't been entirely successful, but all the changes were moving in the wrong direction. And they had put up with the new Labour uh, experiment, and then they put up with Ed Miliband, with the, a leader who comes from the soft left, who is sympathetic to the soft left, who's not anti-union, he's bound to give us a, a you know, reasonable uh, opportunity to have some sort of policy influence. Instead, what they get is the Collins Review, as I mentioned. The Collins Review is driven um, by a false uh, controversy. If you remember the Falkirk controversy where allegedly Unite was engaged in rigging ballots. Well, it did turn out to be true, but these allegations were used to justify a right-wing attack on the, union, um, on the union role within the Labour Party. And so... Um, they got to a situation where, uh, come 2015, they haven't been able to fight against austerity. Their membership is going down. Their ability to do anything with their membership in terms of industrial action is increasingly weakened. Um, and their role within the, 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 historically their party is being greatly reduced. That's what I mean by an existential crisis. So for the first time, they decide to back the candidate who actually whose policies are closest to union policy. There's another factor as well, of course, actually, if you look at what's going on, there's been a shift to the left at the base of the trade unions since 1997, actually, since uh, the, experience, the beginning of the New Labour experience. You could possibly trace it before then, but the point is that New Labour drove a lot of trade unions <coughs> to the left 
and that resulted in the election of uh, sort of the so-called awkward squad. But it also meant that when they came into this uh, leadership election, the um, their computer systems were telling them uh, who their members were logging on to vote for. So they could see where the stats were telling them. The stats were telling them that overwhelmingly their members were logging on to vote for Corbyn. Now union leaders, um, uh, as out of touch as they can be, they have to be thinking about their ability to communicate with their own membership apart from anything else. So apart from all the structural and contextual factors inclining them to support uh, the radical left candidate for the first time, um, there was a simple fact that their members were pushing them in that direction. Even Dave Prentice had to think about this. Of course, he had an election coming up. So, two steps. First of all, we got him on the ballot, and we got union backing for the first time. Then there's the shift in the membership. And this comes from uh, much wider and more diffuse processes. You can start by looking at what happens to a combination of the credit crunch, on the one hand, and broader social demographic shifts on the other. So the social demographic shift is you've got younger people um, more and more going through <coughs> higher education, more and more inclined to a kind of social liberalism, not necessarily leaning to the left, but then you've got the credit crunch and subsequent austerity processes and the changes to the uh, structure of British employment, meaning that increasingly more and more young people are locked out of the employment system, they're locked out of the property market, the apparatuses of so-called meritocracy, whereby if you go to university and work hard, you know, you'll at least have a chance, that's the idea, that's being eviscerated. So if you're a working class young person, increasingly, uh, your chances are looking pretty forlorn. So that's one part of the radicalization, you know, and you saw some of this um, in the uh, build-up uh, to uh, the Labour leadership election, because shortly after the uh, election defeat, Labour's election defeat, there was a big and rather angry anti-austerity protest in the heart of London for the first time in years. After 2011, the left had been pretty much absent from the scene. The major driving force in UK politics uh, between 2011 and 2015 was UKIP. And with predictable consequences. And suddenly in 2015, there's this revival of some sort of political protest and militancy. Okay. Um, and once they get into the Labour Party, they fuse with the uh, older, extant, hard left networks that have been around for a long, long time. They didn't die, um, they just went underground. They would turn up at people's assembly protests and what have you, and just not say they were in the Labour Party. But they were in the Labour Party. Um, and, um, you know, so essentially you had a fusion uh, of those two elements um, to create the sort of pro Corbyn bloc within the constituency membership. Important to say, by the way, that the new members, by and large, ideologically, not doctrinaire hard wingers at all, left wingers at all, not particularly necessarily, I mean, radicalizing, moving in a left wing direction, but could be pulled in lots of other directions too. Okay, so um, that's that part of it. But then there's, of course, a wider media and cultural battle to be fought. And for Jeremy Corbyn, it's quite important that he doesn't fight the media battle in the same way that the other candidates would. The other candidates uh, would seek to do the typical thing. You uh, try to select some thematics that come from the centre, um, that link your left-wing ideas and policies to the centre, if you've got any left-wing ideas and policies, um, and uh, that makes sense within the media spectacle, within the uh, pattern of received opinion. If Jeremy Corbyn does that, he doesn't have a chance. Because the whole point about Jeremy Corbyn is that his base consists very largely of young people and older people who basically are sick to death of the media. They don't trust the media, they don't like what the media says, they don't want somebody who sounds like a, a standard media politician. So, in, this, in essence, what Jeremy Corbyn does is he goes out and says what's on his mind. He says what he thinks, and he speaks with what I think uh, a New Yorker writer described as a kind of priestly clarity. He sums up his politics in very simple slogans. If anybody else said uh, something about the politics of kindness, you'd never stop throwing up. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn says it, it's kind of, well, that's kind of his politics. That's him, essentially. You kind of believe it. You still want to throw up, but you also feel kindly towards him, right? So, essentially, um, He's uh, coming out as an advocate for um, a, a group of people who've never particularly liked neoliberal capitalism <coughs> and suddenly now have a kind of representative and who are now uh, coming out of the woodworks partly because of the damage that's been done to them through years of austerity and all the rest of it. Okay? Uh, 
So it's that minority, I mean, it's not a majority of British society, but it's a radicalizing minority. Maybe about a third of British society is moving in this direction. Okay. Um, and so he's winning this battle partly just by saying what's on his mind. The other thing about it is, I mean, I've been talking about what enabled him to get to this uh, sort of situation, but you've also got to take into account the innovation of the labor right. And, um, you know, we can talk about a number of the factors for that. Scotland's a big part of that. Um, <laughs> Because, of course, Scotland was always the bastion of the Labour right. And in 2014, uh, they, they screwed up massively uh, by running a campaign, uh, a pro-union campaign, which refused to distinguish itself in very important ways from the, uh, the Conservatives. Sorry, that's me. Um, and in that way, alienated quite a large part of their hotline vote. But essentially, the wipeout of the uh, Labour Party uh, in Scotland uh, in 2015, meant uh, was a serious uh, disorienting and damaging blow to the whole infrastructure of the labour line, such that uh, when they came up against Corbyn, they were in a weakened state. But also, more generally, by that time, there had been a serious degeneration. Uh, most of the people who came up uh, in the new labour area sort of era on the right were special advisors, you know, people from a gilded generation of... They never had to do politics in any real sense, like talk to audiences. They never had to defend their ideas. They assumed that was already done. So it was just a question of um, uh, coming up with a good PR strategy. And if you remember Liz Kendall's advertisements, uh, where she's sitting in front of the computer saying, I won't stop ever. Um, essentially, that was her message. Um, and there was not, nothing behind it. When Jeremy Corbyn got in a debate with them, there was a, a notorious instance uh, on London uh, radio LBC where essentially uh, they were all asked the same question, would you have Ed Miliband in your shadow cabinet? And they all avoided the question apart from Jeremy Corbyn, he just gave a straightforward answer. Um, and it was, it was symptomatic of the whole thing. Even when he talked about more substantive things like austerity, they couldn't find out how to disagree with him. They couldn't muster a, a coherent campaign. They were actually, the, camp the Corbyn campaign were seriously surprised by how weak the labor right were in this context. Now, of course, you've got to bear in mind the fact that they decided to split up their uh, uh, campaign into three countries, um, or at least they couldn't overcome that splitting, as they did, tried to do this year. So there was this um, innovation of the labor right on the one hand, um, their disorganization, their losses, um, and then going into the kind of complacent assumption that they had an entitlement to rule, which indeed still seems to be the case. And there's the constitution, a very German of a new left uh, under uh, Jeremy Corbyn's campaign. Okay, so that gets us to as, as far as Jeremy Corbyn actually winning. But what is it symptomatic of? What is the broader picture? Because when we talk about um, uh, class struggle in this country, quite often we think about uh, trade unions, we think about picket lines and all the rest of it, and that's a big part of it. Um, but of course, um, you know, at a certain level, class struggle is fought out, I mean, the highest level in a way, class struggle is fought out politically at the level of party politics and things like that. Not just parliament, I mean, you know, in terms of just uh, being politically organized. And I think what's happened in the last 30 years or so, but increasingly and with an accelerating rate in the last few years, has been a slow degeneration of the main form of bourgeois political organization, which is parliamentary democracy. Right? Um, by that I mean, essentially, there's been declining voter participation, declining party membership, declining party identification, and this is happening across all the core industrial democracies, and it particularly affects the poor and the working class, and therefore it has disproportionate consequences for social democratic parties. Um, essentially what's happening is that there's a large part of the electorate that is increasingly excluded. They're not represented, therefore they don't bother to vote. Right? Um, and on the other side of that, of course, you've got an increasing withdrawal of politicians into the state. And a crude example of that, look before the last, uh, the 2015 general election. Nick Clegg is coming up to the general election knowing that he's going to get annihilated. He sees the Lib Democide right in front of him. Uh, they're talking about uh, polling figures in the range of 8%, and I think that's what they got in the end. And hardly any seats. I think they got eight seats. And he knows this is coming. And he says, any government without the Liberal Democrats will not be a legitimate government. 
Well, why does he think that? He thinks that because, well, the Liberal Democrats are potential kingmakers, and because we've got people on uh, select committees, and because we've built up good alliances, cross-party alliances. So in, this, in essence, what I'm saying is that the decline of uh, bourgeois democracy, representative democracy, whatever you want to call it, is one in which there's been a, a mutual withdrawal. Okay? And one of the things that that does, one of the things that that has done everywhere, has been that people uh, in moments of crisis have been willing to look for a new representative. Okay? So they don't feel represented. But they also don't trust, and I mentioned this about the media, they don't trust the representation of representation. The media is supposed to show you what you look like. Right? It's an image of yourself. This is the argument you're having. I mean, if you watch Newsnight, does that look like you? If you watch Channel 4 News, does that look like the kind of argument that you're having? It looks like the kind of argument that a small sort of political media class, I want to call it that, has been having amongst themselves. And it's not surprising, therefore, that when they look at someone like Jeremy Corbyn, they can't make sense of him. He may as well come from Mars for all, uh, for all they care, because essentially he's talking about things that are completely outside their conversation. So um, there's been this um, uh, decline in the representative structures, and that's created an opening, not just for kind of populist challengers of the types of Podemos and so on, and even to an extent Bernie Sanders, but also for challengers from the radical left. Um, and I think that if you, were, if you situate it in that context, it's easier to understand how Jeremy Corbyn was able to see off the coup. All right? I'll wrap it up here, actually, because that uh, sort of um, can bring us up to date, if you like. Um, how did Jeremy Cor Corbyn see off the coup? Any other leader of the Labour Party who had faced that level of opposition and that kind of opposition would have resigned. Um, what they did was a very well orchestrated uh, series of maneuvers. In narrow terms, it was a very well executed coup, and it uh, went according to the Tom Watson script. Right? Tom Watson was the one who organized the um, ousting of Blair back in 2006, uh, using many of the same tactics. Well, you know, if your power is gained by forming alliances within uh, the state, Forming, uh, you know, uh, good friendships and connections, networks with uh, think tanks, businesses, and particularly the media. If that's where you get your power from, well, of course, then you are going to bloody resign because you haven't got anything else to back you up. But Jeremy Corbyn just happened to have a much broader conception of social and political power than they did. And so when they came for Jeremy Corbyn using these um, techniques, yes, it looked awful. It looked for a week like he might really have to go. Like, he might be bullied and blackmailed into doing it. But instead, what he did was he, he said, the only strength that we on the left have ever had has been our numbers, our organization, and our ideological clarity, right? A sense of, that we know what the stakes are, and we have a broad strategic vision. And he appealed to the movement. And the movement responded. I mean, when I talk about the movement, I mean, we can talk about the movement in a very sentimental way. There is not uh, much sign of an actual movement, but let's just say that there is... Um, uh, an audience, um, there is a, a sort of a radical left out there that can be summoned into a movement. And he appealed to people from the Labour left and from beyond the Labour left, and they turned out. And the result of that was, as you know, that he drew more people into the Labour Party, recruited, I think it was more than, uh, it was at least 100,000, possibly more, um, uh, new members and supporters into the Labour Party in a very short space of time. Um, and put uh, the um, uh, sort of coup merchants on the back foot. And once they were put on the back foot, it was very clear that they didn't have anything. They didn't have a usurper. They hadn't agreed on who their candidate would be. Turned out it was somebody who made cop jokes for a living and told women they should put uh, cop stoppers in their mouths because you know, uh, evidently they're too mouthy. That's the idea. So they got someone who was a, a sort of sexist joker um, who didn't have a clear alternative. Essentially, who didn't even dare to agree on the fundamentals of policy with Jeremy Corbyn, just presented himself as somebody who had essentially the same ideas, but was a bit safer and a bit uh, uh, more media-friendly. So they didn't have a political alternative. They didn't have an alternative candidate. And above all, and this is something that the Blairites have started to acknowledge, they didn't have any answers to the crisis of labor. Because the crisis of labor is not new, and it wasn't invented by Jeremy Corbyn, and there is a crisis. The crisis of labor is something that's going back several decades, and you can look at it like this. 
New Labour was the first attempt to answer that crisis seriously from the right, and it attempted to answer that crisis by turning social democracy into something else, something we sometimes call social liberalism, essentially a neoliberalized social democratic party. Um, Corbyn is doing it from the left. It's the first, it represents the first attempt to address the crisis of social democracy from the left. And it's not really clear what that actually means in practice, what Labourism is to become. But it so happens, quite by chance, and we have done nothing to deserve this, but we could end up with, indeed we seem to be ending up with, a mass left-wing Labour Party with parliamentary representation and trade union backing. In other countries, uh, they've had to have a split from social democracy, a radical left party <coughs> being formed, usually getting around 10% of the vote, not, not really getting much union backing, struggling and so on. And somehow in this country, despite everything, despite all the failures of the left, despite all the weaknesses of the left, we end up, uh, just because of the sheer calamitous incompetence of the traditional political guard and management, uh, we end up potentially with this uh, mass left-wing political organization. Um, and uh, that is wide open for the future in terms of the struggle. Um, and it's, if you want to talk about concretizing how we um, uh, sort of Im implement a possible transition away from not just neoliberal capitalism, but capitalism as such, uh, it seems to me that the first step has to be what happens to the Labour Party, because all of our fates depends on that. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, so, yes, um, so I'm going to be going off in a quite different direction than Richard did uh, in this sort of combined event, which as it turns out is the opening night of the transcontinental uh, Richard Seymour Peter Frey's speaking uh, tour that will have its second and final date in Boston next month. That one was planned, this was not as much planned. Um, so these books are, by, our books are both about socialism, but in pretty much completely different ways. Uh, whereas Richard is talking about the day-to-day -day of moving you know, forward the project of building a left labor party that can contest power and capitalism. I'm talking about something Richard mentioned in the end, the project of eventually moving beyond capitalism altogether. And this book is a thought experiment, essentially. It's an attempt to update our vision and our imagination about what possible post-capitalist futures would look like, because I think that's needed. I think much of what the, the old sort of socialist and Marxist tra tradition in that sense is relevant, but much of it is not. And there's sort of a need for, as Sacha said, the sort of vision and imagination that drives people to do, you know, day-to-day -day things like, you know, <coughs> organizing their constituency labor party. And so, uh, where I'm going to start, you know, monitor, give, telling you the structure of this book is with austerity, which is at the center of the whole Corbyn, you know, phenomenon, of course, the fight against austerity. And I think one of the things, both, you know, in the United States, where I'm from, and here, that motivates people in the struggle against austerity is the recognition that it is an artificial austerity, an imposed austerity, that is mandated not by some fact of nature or fact of the economy, but that is a political decision that benefits a few and that makes the rest suffer. And that relates to a fundamental concern of you know, the entire socialist movement, one of the things that animated it, which was the dream of abundance, of the anti-austerity world in which we can, in fact, live lives of unprecedented leisure and minimal work. And the, this basic argument has been there since the beginning of capitalism, that cap the productivity of a capitalist economy Capitalism only benefits the capitalist class for the most part, but that in another form of society could benefit all of us. And so the starting point of this book is to sketch out sort of a premise. What if, let me back up a second. There's, a, there's been a resurgence of interest lately and fear lately about the prospect of automa automa automation, robotization, computerization, algorithms, things that replace human labor, potentially take jobs, you know, potentially create the jobless future, which in a capitalist society is, of course, the nightmare scenario where people are dependent upon wage labor, and if they're cut up off from it, they become destitute. Just on the way here from the US, I was writing Norwegian Air, and I picked up the in-flight magazine, and there was a big spread about the rise of automation and whether you should be scared of it. It seems to be everywhere now. And I should stress that this is not a new anxiety. In fact, it has existed as long as industrial capitalism has existed. But I think we're seeing another wave of it. 
And the point, as it always has been, is that the capitalist drive toward increasing productivity is a fundamental feature of the system, and that part of the socialist and Marxist critique is that without fundamental changes of social relations, we cannot take advantage of the possibility that that holds. So this book starts as a thought experiment by saying, well, okay, what if it were possible to sort of automate everything, to essentially remove the need for human labor from the system? Uh, and then, and so from there I sketch out four sort of possible futures that one might imagine. Simplified, you know, exaggerated, ten, intended to draw out certain specific problematics, certain specific issues. And the way I get to those four futures is through an elaboration of an old concept from the, the German socialist Rosa Luxemburg that we face the choice between moving forward into socialism or regressing into barbarism. But instead of two futures, I have four. So the way this works, and unfortunately I don't have the ability to do the visual here, is by a sort of uh, a two by two grid that gives you these, these futures. Right? So what are the so we presupposed sort of the automated future. What are the other issues we have to think about? Well, the first axis I call is the ecological axis. So this is the question of climate change, of resource scarcity, the carrying capacity of the earth. So even if human labor can be reduced to a minimum, we can't sort of have arbitrarily high levels of stuff if the earth cannot support it. And so to the extent that we are unable to overcome that by moving to renewable energy, finding ways to address climate change, so on and so forth, to the extent that we are limited in that way, we face a real scarcity, not the artificial scarcity of capitalism, but a, but a real scarcity that must be organized in some way. So that's sort of one point of differentiation. The other point of differentiation is what I call the axis of class struggle. In other words, is it the hierarchical society we live in now in which power and material wealth are monopolized by an elite, or is it an egalitarian society, the sort of the dream of socialism? And that is sort of where the politics comes into this. And this book is in some ways an intervention into the kind of futurist genre of book that tries to tell you this is what the future things are going to be like in 50 years when all these magical technologies come online. And either it's the dystopia where nobody has a job or it's wonderful because, you know, it's like, you know, it's good technology is going to solve all our problems. And my argument in the book is that this political axis is the most important one in terms of saying that this is, it's a matter of collective struggle. It's a matter of the outcome of things like, you know, the struggle over the Labor Party that, that determines exactly how this stuff plays out in the future. So I'll just step, so the four futures are basically laid out in four chapters that fall into these four boxes. And the sort of odd way in which I chose to do the book was to mix together, you know, resources from social science, empirical stuff that's going on in the present with citations from science fiction in order to give sort of texture to these, these futures, because I want them to seem not just sort of like, somewhat less, less like dry abstractions. Um, so I sort of, I'll start with the kind of, the, the super utopia, which is what I call communism, drawing on the sort of schematic reading of Marx that you often hear that says there's these two stages. You have socialism, where the state controls the means of production, and then you have communism, where, you know, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need, and every, the free association of producers pursues projects as they like. And if you're unconstrained by scarcity, and you're unconstrained by the need for much human labor, then you live in this world. And sort of the first tricky thing in thinking about this is to think about then, what are the sort of like conflicts and problems of this world? Because often people hear this, and their first thought is obviously, well, it's so you know utopian, why even bother thinking about it, but also like, is this the end of history? Does, where does sort of challenge and interest and conflict and you know, any sort of, you know, sort of texture to human life come from? And so I explore in the book just sort of the various ways in which different kinds of sort of status hierarchies, different kinds of conflicts within even sort of smaller groups can play out <coughs> in a world where you no longer have sort of capital and labor as that master sort of magnetic the sort of magnet of capital and labor drawing all other kinds of social conflict into its orbit. So, and so I talk about some of the examples, for example, that people who are sort of utopian about the possibilities of 
sort of voluntary sort of techno-communism in the present. We'll talk about, for example, Wikipedia, the collective. Anybody could come and edit Wikipedia. But of course, if you read about the history of Wikipedia, there are all kinds of problems having to do with small clicks of editors controlling articles, disproportionate numbers of the articles being written by men, and then therefore the subject matter being tilted in certain ways, various fights over, complicated fights over edits. It's, none of this stuff is sort of reducible to, you know, the fundamental, the existence of wage labor, the existence of the capital relation that I started off with. But it's, sort of, but it's sort of like, it's the sort of thing that will arise in any kind of collectivity that tries to undertake a common project, which I imagine is what people would like, often like to do when they are freed from the demands of labor. And so, yeah, I cite one of the science fiction works I cite is by uh, the American author Cory Doctorow, in which a, in a sort of a post-scarcity society in which a bunch of people take over and collectively run Disneyland. And all kinds of crazy infighting and fights and you know conflicts happen, but none of which are about money or about material need, right? So that's the sort of direction. I that's the sort of problem I want to draw out is the sort of like what happens to social conflicts once you remove the capital relation. Um, so that's future one. Future two is actually the first one I thought of. The first thing I ever wrote that led to this book was an essay only about this world, and so it's asking. We still have total abundance, total possibility to produce without labor. But the interesting thing here is all, so many of these kind of bourgeois futurist writers sort of assume, well, if we have the capability to do that, we will do it. Right? And the utopia here is like the Star Trek TV series, where they have machines where at the push of a button you can have anything you want. It seems like it's essentially a kind of a communist society in which people sort of, if you want to get in a spaceship and fly around, you can, but you don't have to. You don't have to do anything. It's far. But, the problem is that, of course, the capitalist class doesn't, won't, won't simply allow, allow that future to arise simply because it's materially possible. You know, the insight being that control over money and capital is a form of social power, not just a way of accruing stuff, and that therefore there's a desire to maintain that power. And so the second chapter is about a system I refer to as rentism, because in the absence of much of sort of material uh, production by means of human labor, what you get is a lot of stuff that's based on rent. So rent in the traditional sense, as such as rent on land, you know, uh, is there. But then it's extended to you know new forms of property, specifically intellectual property, that allow a the owner to extract a stream of rents for something like a digital copy of a movie, or that can be copied for free, or a pharmaceutical that's almost free to produce, but that can be sold at a huge markup because of the patent ownership. And the, the sort of like the chapter walks through the various peculiarities and contradictions of this kind of society, which include the problem of if you want to sort of accumulate money as a form of social power, you need people to pay sort of their pay to, for the licensing fee to replicate stuff. But if there's no need for human labor, how do people earn the money? You need some jobs probably for lawyers to sue people and guards to lock them up for illegal copying. But there's problems of underemployment. There's problems of Stagnation, and I sort of go through these various, the various sort of contradictions of that kind of a society. Um, and in fact, the opening, uh, the opening uh, vignette for that chapter is from a Scottish science fiction author, Charles Strauss, and his book Accelerando, which opens in a world that somewhat resembles the, the one that I sketch out in that chapter. So, then that's future two. Leaving the world of abundance, we get into the question of what, how do we deal with things like the effects of the climate crisis? Uh, first of all, how do we deal with them in an egalitarian way? And this is where the sort of old socialist problematics, I call this world socialism because the old socialist problematic of economic planning comes back on the agenda. Um, it's, not, it's not quite the same problem because it's, we're not talking about, again, we're still not talking about needs for massive amounts of human labor. It's not so much planning production as it is consumption, both consumption of the, in, consumption of the inputs, essentially, to any kind of, you know, replicator or whatever, 3D printer or automatic production technology. You know, it's a matter of sort of balancing the sort of load that people put on the earth. And so here I go into a couple of different themes, one of which has to do with the sort of production of nature, as the geographer Neil Smith put it, or the management of nature, the way in which a lot of environmentalist tropes sort of entail that, you know, humans are a blight on nature and we need to sort of withdraw from it. And, get it back to its pristine state, but that in fact the eco-socialist world is one of like increasing entanglement with nature and increasing modification of nature because nature is essentially us and it's essentially becoming, you know, 
it, it's essentially a, it's a management of the natural environment, I think, inevitably. Um, so, and then the second aspect of it is to talk a little bit about, you know, I talk a little bit about economic planning and the way the sort of older arguments about planning relate to the things that I'm talking about here. But then, it's, then, I also, and then I also go to the debate about planning and markets. And the idea that markets are often seen on the left and by Marxists as sort of antithetical to the socialist project. But that the way I see it, that has more to do with the you know, unequal endowment of resources and money in capitalism, which means that insofar as, the, as, insofar as things are determined through market exchange, whoever has more money has more power in that exchange. But in a system in which, for example, you sort of allocate access to resources in a fairly egalitarian way, some types of limited markets could be sort of a technical mechanism for managing scarcity without having endless meetings or you know, planning boards or whatever. Um, so those are the things I sort of draw out in that chapter. Um, finally, we get to this super crazy dystopian chapter that everyone thinks is either ridiculous or can't, you know, or can't stop talking about long enough to get to the other parts. Um, so we have scarcity, but now we have not won the class struggle. So now where are we? Well, here I get at a central thing, the central contradiction of the relationship between capital and labor that is <coughs> in older forms of capitalism, which is a relationship of mutual dependence. Workers depend upon capitalists because they don't control the means of production. They don't have access to the means of survival without selling their labor or their labor power. Um, and the capitalist depends on the workers to produce. And this produces the fundamental contradiction in which workers have exercise a tremendous amount of leverage and yet face a tremendous amount of danger in imposing capital. In the sort of world of my premise, the world of the, the automated future, this is, a, this is a, of a d diminishing importance. Uh, the rich are less and less dependent on massive pools of labor. And so, and because there is some fundamental scarcity constraint, the rentist future doesn't work, because why? Because the rich are essentially diminishing their own living standards in order to lord, lord it over others. And so then what you get is a dynamic in which there are just huge amounts of populations that are from the perspective of the rich, purely surplus. Uh, and this leads to the kinds of things we see, you know, I, the things we see around us in terms of just People in their enclave, they go from gated cities to private islands to, you know, this sort of, the, you know, the inverted gulag of wealth surrounded by misery. And, you know, if you have drones and you have robot guards and you have surveillance technology, you, you know, you can protect yourself from the masses without sort of interacting with them in any way. And so this future is the one, borrowing and repurposing a term from E.P. Thompson is the one I call exterminism, because in the long run, these are, these are, from the perspective of the rich, again, surplus populations. And whether it doesn't, not necessarily in the form of sort of a, you know, sort of a over, you know, genocidal campaign, but in the form of, even in the form of neglect, the, po the prospect that mass numbers of people, as in many parts of the world, many mass numbers of people ought, now are, will basically be consigned, you know, will live in refugee camps, will die of disease epidemics, will die in flooding. That's, the, that's that world, and it's also the world of endless war. It's the world of uh, you know, the militarization of domestic police, police forces. So those, are, and those, so those are the problematics that I draw out of that chapter. And so to bring it all back sort of to where I started, what I want the book to do is give some vision both of the good and the bad, sort of what potentially lies ahead. <laughs> but to do so in a way that's open-ended and not, you know, the problem about sort of what Marx called writing recipes for the kitchens of the future is that, first of all, it's, you know, like Yogi Berra, the baseball player, said, prediction is hard, particularly about the future. And <laughs> the other problem is that it sort short circuits the sort of democratic essence of the socialist project itself. If you try to predict in advance what's going to happen, then you've already foreclosed the very possibility that people can make their own history. So this way, I'm trying to just sort of give these kind of conceptual, this conceptual matrix as a way of sort of organizing our thinking without falling into that trap. And also, finally, again, to reintroduce to this kind of discourse the fundamental significance of politics and of collective action to determining the directions in which we can go. Um, and I will leave it there and see where we go from here.